understanding that current scaling retail is her book, her blog, her speeches. She knows everything about you, the consumer, the new consumer. You don't know anything about me. <laughs> but the new consumer is definitely on her wavelength. And she has done a fabulous job of analyzing retail on that regard. What are the most important issues for you, for you as you see it at retail, certainly for Joie, what, what was your most important issue? And then, and Malcolm, what is the legal ramification of this? When I started Joie, I started with a partner and we didn't want to use my name, but we were having a really hard time finding a, a brand name that worked for us, or that we felt would resonate with the customers. So we ended up using my name, and when we did that in the agreement, we I knew that it, there was a possibility that I wouldn't always have the right to use Joa, the name Joa as a brand. And so in the agreement that I set up from the beginning, I was able to use my name as a designer in perpetuity. So I might not be able to use it as a brand name, but I could use it as a byline if I wanted to. So if I was working on another brand, I could call it such and such by Joie Rubber. So that was how we dealt with that. But um, the larger issue, I think, really is when your heart and soul is in a brand, really thinking about and preparing for a possibility of not being a part of it. And um, I think that that's the thing that all designers, whether it's your name or it's your brand name, it doesn't necessarily mean your personal name, but that you really plan backups to hang on to your brand if that's what you want to do, or you have a strategy for staying in the brand. So I think one of the big things is there are so many, it's funny to hear about like, just the, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so you know, there, there, there's all these legal use cases on things, and I work with a lot of startup and growth stage companies, right? So businesses who are um, fighting to get their names out there, fighting to get exposure, and what's really interesting is, you know, just the other day, one of our clients ended up tagging a photo, like using a hashtag, stagecoach, and she was using it because she wanted to get traffic and kind of cross promote her products as being available and you know wanting to be a part of the festival and trying to align herself with this festival and she got a cease and desist email saying they had no right um, to be able to use even the hashtag of stagecoach um, from this legal entity that you know I guess was going through and saying you know shame on you don't do that and um, to be honest, I was super shocked. I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that hashtags were so protected, right? I mean, we hear about some of the more basic things that Ilsa went through, but even things like tagging images or hashtags um, are now also a thing. And so to me, you know, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective on this um, because I was really surprised. You know, right now, a lot of social media integrations on platforms like Shopify are really easy to be able to cross-promote your Instagram, right, or cross-promote even hashtags. So, for example, if you install this particular app on your website, you go on there and you can say, okay, I'm going to only feature the hashtag X, right? So let's say the hashtag is little black dress or the hashtag is whatever you want it to be. And then all of the images that are part of that hashtag can then be rendered onto your site, right? And you can kind of you leverage and use that to sell your products. So now I'm wondering, you know, given these new technology integrations and how we've been trying so hard to synthesize online shopping with Instagram, you know, how we will now have to adapt and change um, given some of these, you know, bigger legal ramifications. Because I can tell you, Almost everyone I work with has a shop Instagram, right, on their on their Shopify sites. Um, almost everyone is tagging or cross promoting other celebrities or brands, and um, even so much as you know the example you showed Ilsa of um, you know Cindy Crawford in a pair of jeans. Well, what brand doesn't feel entitled to be able to share that kind of news? Um, so the unlawyer thing that I always tell people is to ask for forgiveness and uh, take it down and say you're sorry and you didn't know better. Um, but I imagine that's not the answer we're going to give. <laughs> no, actually, you'll be, you have to decide how you take a chance is to see how the law is evolving, how will it ultimately look like if it ever came to a dispute. And a lot of times, as, as weird as it sounds, it only comes down to an issue of, gee, I, I see what you're doing and I see what you're comparing it against. And the question is, 
Uh, number one, you have to protect your brand, and you have to protect your trademarks and all of those basics, and clients get cheap. They say, well, I'm, gonna I'm only gonna record one trademark, and I'm like, no, you really have to record eight or nine and have a, have a line that you're getting ready. Every time you look at something, you are a statistic. And there are people who analyze these statistics, and they will only bother you when you're getting a lot of clicks. Well, one of the messages we are hearing here, and so I'd love to have you address this, and also how do you maintain your viability as a brand, is you must have a lawyer. But there was a whole plan, according to our income, over time, what trademarks we could afford to apply for, whether it was China, which was one of our number one. And, we, and this was actually before the huge internet explosion right. it was at the very beginning but we did have a plan year to year this this year would be germany the next year and it was according to our where, how big we thought the market would be so china was number one but then we had a plan so what they do is they're worried about how much is the lawyer going to cost and how much are the trademarks going to be and they try and do it on the cheap the one thing that joa just said which is exactly on the money is have a plan don't just say, well, I'm gonna do the United States today and I'll do China manana or sometime in the future and I don't know. You have to develop a plan. Social media strategies are not meant to be set in the beginning and stay stagnant. What is worked, what worked yesterday, right? How are people engaging and involving? Now, what's so amazing is that Facebook and Instagram have such a huge, huge um, interest and stake in really bridging their platforms to online sales. So that means on the brand side of things, you're gonna slowly be able to see different kinds of tech rollouts. For example, shopping through stories. Um, there's nothing worse than having something that is stale and stagnant and that doesn't evolve. You know, the best way they used to say to make noise is, you know, get a bunch of followers and make it look like you have big followings. And now big brands like Unilever are spending tons of money now to make sure and vet that their influencers actually have real followers. The technology is there now in order to see how valid your social presence is, which means, which is great for you on the brand side, because if you employ some of these technologies, you'll then be able to know how to invest your dollars better in terms of influencer marketing. But if you, you know, let's say someone's looking to evaluate um, your brand value or you want to get a business partner, you know, they might want to know how real is your business, right? How valid um, are your followers? How valid is your social proof, right? And all of that is really social proof based. Um, retail buyers, your direct to consumer brands, everyone needs to have social proof. We're starting to see more in terms of quality of users, engagement, time that they're spending on the site, um, with that traffic that's coming through Instagram as really more of a testament to what your Instagram platforms and social media is doing for you, right? The last thing is your Instagram is not a sales channel to just broadcast information, right? A lot of times we think about every image needs to be a picture that I can sell, every image needs to be a quote, your quotes are in different fonts, it looks really sloppy, your images are not well art directed, they look kind of unedited. It's a visual communications tool that's changing rapidly on a daily basis by what you can see, consume, and like interact with. So I say experiment, right? I mean, I think that's the, really the best thing to do. Try new things, evaluate quarterly, look at it monthly. How can you change your social media strategy? I remember 10 years ago, people were getting jobs as community managers, and I'd be like, that sounds like horse shit. Like, what is a community manager? Like, who does that? And now it's like, on our team, we have someone who manages our scaling retail community, right? It's like they're editing, they're engaging. I mean, similar to the, you know, the line item for a lawyer, most brands think they can handle social on their own. If you're doing it right, you're not doing it on your own. Can a brand go completely digital and ignore traditional marketing channels and achieve the same effect? Would it, I mean, it would, it's, it's, it's possible, but I don't think that it's the best way of doing things. I think that, you know. Well, right when, now, when, every digital brand is going pop up. Right. Everyone. When you have a conversation, it's, it's like we're, you're talking about a one dimensional conversation. And I think every conversation has to be multi dimensional. Exactly. So for, for a brand to be really important to me, and for me to have a meaningful conversation, 
it needs to be not boring, not stale, it needs to change, it needs to grow, and it needs to have different outlets and different subjects. So I don't think that you can build a, a brand in just one way with everything that's happening in the world. There's too much going on. There's that's, too that's many the different point, right? there's too many different ways to communicate your story and to also build your story. I think it needs to be multi-dimensional. You can't just do it one way. Uh, that's my belief. I don't know. Totally. What do you think? I think, you know, what's really crazy guys is there's been a whole resurgence towards back to print mail and yeah. catalog mailers, postcard mailers. I mean, the best brands are now delivering you mail. And why is that? ASOS yeah. Is doing it. And it's attention arbitrage, right? They're like, all right, well, where is it cheap to get in front of my customer? Oh, no one says mail except for like, you know, T-Mobile and Value Pack and like magazines and stuff, right? So who sends you mail? Well, no one does, right? So when you think about the value of someone's attention, right? Attention is, is eyeballs on something. If you get a piece of mail, you're more likely to consume that piece of mail because you just don't get an, a lot of it. Unlike email, you get so much of it, your mind is already filtering to the content that you want to see and ignoring other pieces of content. So I totally agree. I mean, it's a 360 consumer approach. It's, it's print mailers, Warby Parker, Amor Vert, ASOS, Cezanne, right? I, it's like HelloFresh. Um, all of these companies are doing that. There is also an element I think that gets ignored, which is just the human contact with people. And people, when they hear your story and they, they hear about your products, they hear about what you're trying to do with your brand, if you're, if you're in love with it, they'll become in love with it. And then you'll get all the support you need. I mean, that's been my experience. If yeah. I'm not a savvy, no, Instagram queen. So let, let me tie in. I have a client that was selling a piece of real estate and they had, they had actually had a manager for their content putting it on Zillow and Redfin and Realtor.com and all of those places. And the next thing you know, they, they sold it. And when they asked the buyer, the buyer how the buyer had seen it, the buyer said, well, I actually picked up the Sunday LA Times and I picked it up and I read it there. And so he said, I can't believe it. I thought that it was going to sell because Zillow and Redfin replaced the LA Times. I said, well, not really. I mean, what you just learned was a very good example of what you just said. It has to be multi-tiered. You don't know where, it's, where the next person is going to come from for, for the product, how you're going to end up getting your message out, and also the human contact. I, I just want to say something uh, or, or give a, an Uncle Mal piece of advice for the crowd regarding um, the issue of... Uh, of the human contact that Joa just talked about. Yes, we have the same situation with lawyers. My associates, my, I'm in charge of our 11 associates that are at different stages of their career, three to nine years in practice, and they would rather send an email than make a phone call. And I constantly tell them, make a phone call. But sometimes that phone call, if you make the judgment that that may be more effective in a variety of ways, then you're going to do it. So don't rule out any traditional means of communication as we accelerate through all of the novelties and innovations that social media gives us. So celebrity intersex influence, right? So when we think about the weight of... I mean, I feel like celebrities were the first influencers, right? So, I mean, now it's kind of been diluted and it's trickled down. As far as the way we think of celebrity on the traditional side of things, so actors and actresses and, you know, that kind of genre of celebrity, I feel like it's really, I mean, it has to be a personal, it has to feel and, and look right, you know? I mean, I can't tell you that every ad I've seen with Vuitton and using different actors have always necessarily felt right. Right? Sometimes collaborations can be too far of a stretch. You know, when you think about choosing the right celebrity endorsements or how you collaborate with celebrities, it's so very important that there's much more synthesis of your values and where you actually are trying to capture a particular customer. It used to be you would hire a celebrity and stick their name on a poster and that was enough in and of itself to lend someone to purchase it. But it's not enough anymore, right? The best celebrity engagements are the ones where they're more deeply connected, where it actually stands for something. This is largely to do with how consumers have changed, right? Consumers are looking a little bit deeper beyond just whose face is endorsing something, right? Consumers are smarter, right? We're all smarter. We know when something's authentic and inauthentic. The best collaborations I've seen lately have been through influencers, and you could call them pseudo-celebrities in their own ways, 
um, have been through them co-creating with a lot of brands, right? So Revolve launched a line with Pia. I don't know if you guys know Pia, but she's pretty small on the influencer side of things, but big in terms of that particular niche demographic. Right, so when you think about how brand is relating or working with celebrity, I think it's more important these days to say, is this collaboration something that's a worthwhile investment? How do I make this run beyond just advertising? Right, how is this part of the product development and product creation? Is it, you know, this brand is now, you know, stamped with approval and this person had, you know, one or two things to say about the collection, but they're more integrated, or is it just from an advertising standpoint? Because I do think the more successful brands and new brands that are launching are looking at influencers from a much more intimate standpoint rather than just pay for play. And that is also to do with the fact that consumers on social media are also a lot more hip to the fact that people are getting endorsed for things, right? So I mean, if we're all much smarter, that means we have to be that much more authentic and we have to invest in the channels that actually make the most sense to our customer, right? Otherwise, they're gonna say, well, this doesn't make sense, right? Why, why is the celebrity partnering up with this brand? But we well, first of all, the, the biggest pitfall at the outset is economics. Yeah. Um, I've negotiated for, uh, on, on behalf of the up and coming brand and somebody gets a connection to somebody who gets a connection and they get a connection to a particular celebrity and then we enter into negotiations and usually what the celebrity wants is way more than what the brand can actually afford to pay right off the bat. And, the, and, and when we get past the struggle of the payment, we get to a variety of other things. And you must understand that every time you enter into an agreement with a celebrity, if you get past the cost aspects, you're going to have a very restrictive agreement. You're going to have reporting requirements. You're going to have things that the business manager and the lawyer throws in. And later on, if you have a problem with the celebrity, you're not going to be able to deal with the celebrity directly to resolve the problem because they're usually going to have the lawyer and the business manager involved in the middle and I'm dealing with them. Also, what I talked about regarding reporting requirements, understand we're, li we're living in an age right now of the Me Too movement, different causes, political struggles, etc. And all of those issues are things that, that we want to protect. If I'm on the celebrity side of the deal, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about tying my name to your product or my client's name to your product because I'm worried that what if you misstep somewhere along the way and you now cause havoc for my client, the client's going to be really pissed off at me for not having done something that allows for protecting the, the variety of things that you could do to harm the issues uh, or the celebrity's image. Conversely, when I'm on your side of it and I'm on the brand side, their side is giving me those same pressures and I'm trying to uh, unloosen the straps of, of all of these restrictions and, it be, and understand it's not simply a two-way street where you're both entering into a, a loving relationship. On that issue, let me just interject because he's not a garmento, but the minute you ship your box to China with your label in it, you have a problem. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what a garmento is, but anyway, no, that, okay, okay, so, so it sounds like a new Italian designer, but anyway, uh, <laughs> it's the best I can do with the material that you gave me, but, 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 no, but, but, but it is true, though, that, that you, if you want to limit it to begin with and, and deal with budgetary considerations, what I think Ilsa is saying, which I agree with, is make sure you record your trademark wherever it is that you are going to be touching or connected with right off the bat. Because I do a lot of work in China, and yes, I tell everybody to register in China because uh, I, was, I went to China for the first time back in the 90s. I've been going to China for 25 years, and I remember when there was no such thing as um, true uh, IP protection, whether it was patents, copyrights, or trademark, it didn't really matter because the concept was still not yet developed that intellectual property is property. Well, with the advent as to with China's growth, et cetera, they do have, they recognize that IP, it is, you can protect IP in China if you do it right. You know, I think um, one of the things people just really don't think about is global infrastructure. And it's so easy to say, let me just switch on my shop and now I'll sell internationally and you know, and yeah. I'll figure it out and you know, but you guys 
customs and duties when you're shipping globally can be really expensive. And when you pass on that, co that, that cost to your customer, they might say, well, I'm not gonna buy that, it's too expensive for me to import this into my country, right? And that's just on like direct to consumer online channels. If you buy something on matchesfashion.com, you will notice, right? They'll say, do you wanna calculate this cost with duties now or later, right? And so there is, there are built in logistics that you need to plan for as you go global. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with building out your infrastructure, let alone, right, once you have that and you understand shipping and logistics, you then have to then proceed with marketing, right? So it's not just, again, flipping on your website and saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna ship internationally, but it's more like, okay, well, what are these different markets? What is your communication strategy? How are you advertising to those people in that market? You can't just turn on an Instagram ad and just market it to everybody globally. There are cultural nuances in marketing that you need to know about if you want to be successful in these global markets. Now, you know, you can take advantage of trends. Obviously right now, you know, it's a huge kind of trend towards like Western Bohemian um, products that are doing really well in like Tokyo right now. That's super amazing and great, right? And you can definitely capitalize on these certain trends. However, you need to make sure that you're setting up your business to ship or to have a local kind of shipping and logistics center that's gonna manage your shipping and returns. We're so used to getting packages within three days. You definitely don't want to put something on a boat and have it show up in three weeks, right? If you're trying to get your speed to market and get your product to the consumer. So I think it's important when you go online and you want to go global that you not only understand, yes, I might need to actually translate all of the copy on my website into these multiple different languages so people are shopping more natively. Yeah, most people in the world speak English, but trust me, like not everyone does, and there's a lot of money in non-English speaking countries, right? So if you want to go global, don't just you know be so presumptuous to assume that saying I ship globally is enough to get people to want to purchase, right? You really need to stack up all of your marketing strategies, your logistics, um, to make sure that you are set up to succeed because most people, like 91% of people who don't buy again from your site or from your products will never tell you why, right? They'll never tell you why they didn't come back to shop. They just don't shop, right? Yeah. The other thing about creating a global brand is that when you have people on site in the countries that you're opening, and I'm not thinking just internet, but selling it's also to retailers, area. being a wholesaler, they did struggle to, to actually establish the United States, which I, I, I think is interesting. Yeah. yeah, I see it happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a lot of the brands, um, it's an interesting question because when we work with like a startup, we'll be like, well, where is your market? And it's not just like, who is your customer within the US, it but like, it expect. may not be what you expect it to yeah. be. And you might find much more like, you know, like US denim brands. Right, some of the startups, small ones, are really good in Japan. Right, right. it's like it's such a big market, um, and it may not always be what you think, and vice versa. Right, like we're taking and importing and looking at styling cues from like brands that are in like Denmark and brands that are doing well in Sweden. Yeah, I think it's that's a really great. Point. And I sort of want to underscore one word in all of that, and and because uh, I agree with all of it, but there's also oversight. You have to have oversight over the over your operations. If you, have, I, I certainly agree that you have to have boots on the ground and people that are reliable. If you're going to have, uh, in, if you're going to be in China, one of the earliest things that I did was develop contacts with the chambers of commerce and the CCPIT, uh, which is a trade arm, et cetera, and get reliable people that I could find out and ask questions about regarding local partners. But once you get the local partner, that's not the end of it. Most of the dispute resolution that I've had to deal with with clients who are having problems with the quality of materials or uh, payments or any number of, let's say, contractual disputes, most of it occurred because my client went asleep at the switch and basically said, well, I, I entered into the contract and I didn't hear from him for nine months and oh, I've been robbed. And I'm like, well, what did you do in the meantime to find out, well, did, you, did you send somebody overseas? Did you check out the quality? Did you look? Did you send somebody to the factory once a month? Was there, in other words, was there, did the other side know that you're gonna be watching the cookie jar? Because if, you, they, if the other side doesn't think you're watching the cookie jar, people tend to be lax. So you have to have the interior, the, the capability in the company of providing oversight.
like meaning having the person power to be able to, to go overseas, interface, not just have a contract and hand it off, but have a contract and then monitor it so that you make sure that it's going to be effective. And, and there are professional monitors. To do oh, yes, there are. Yes, there are. But but I, I, there are professional monitors as long, and, and they some are good and some are excellent. The best ones are the ones I love being sold to. Um, but there have been two examples lately of brands that have been talking about how their pant is the most flattering pant on everybody. And you know what? It's hard to find pants. So, you know, I bought them. And I was <laughs> like, I really want these really flattering pants. And I put them on and they look like shit. And I sent an email and I was like, these pants, <laughs> Everlane, are not super flattering. I was like, this is not. And I, you know, and it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, I get it, it's marketing, there's a fine line, but when you're like, you know, as consumers, we know what pant type looks good on what type of body. So if you were to say, this looks really great on this fit, this looks really great on this type of body, right? Then your consumer, your rate of return, so not to mention the fact that I'm like upset about looking bad in pants, but the rate of return is probably much higher, right? As you move also into kind of, I don't want to call false advertising, but let's say it's like, you know, okay. Puffet, exactly, exactly. And you know, I also, there's another brand and we gotta go, but I got a piece of mail, catalog mail, from a new company based in Los Angeles called Lumia. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, but they are talking about sleep technology while you sleep. And part of their advertising pitch was, all of that excess energy that you're releasing while you sleep, our clothing is going to harness the excess energy and, turn, and bring it back into your body. And I was just like, oh my gosh, really? Like, you know, part of me really wanted to buy it because again, I wanted to like experience it. And then the other part of me was like, you know, how, how, who, and how is this even possible? Because any science-based person would be like, well, our body only keeps the energy that it needs. And of course it expels the energy. So why do you need to harness this energy? The normal person is like, wow, I'm losing energy? Like, I need, you know, anyway, the whole thing totally got me up in arms. Well, it all, they only get you when you're very successful. Let the buyer beware. The, the, yeah. pillow, the pillow person that sells it. Uh, it's a ubiquitous pillow person, okay? And, and initially, the marketing of that pillow was that it's good for you, bad, it's good for your neck. And you notice it doesn't say that anymore. And they were caught on that. So it's, it's, Truth in advertising, but they only, when this person that you're looking at gets to be successful, they'll yeah. sit on him too. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question about the copyright? For example, a startup brand has different designs on their brand. They need to copyright every design. You can copyright yeah. a group. Yes. Thank you. Thank we you. look forward to seeing you again.